I tell you one thing I'm pretty sure you don't spend a lot of time and energy on. And that's trying to persuade somebody else to like the sports teams that you like. What a waste of time, right? If you're from Michigan and you're a Michigan fan and the maize and blue uh, is your be-all, end-all, you don't waste time on Michigan State people trying to convert Sparty uh, and all the Sparty lovers into uh, turning over their green clothes and getting maize and blue. You just pretty much hate each other and that's the way life goes on in Michigan, right? Uh, if you happen to be from the state of cheese and you happen to know there are some purple infiltrators who happen to be uh, moving through the state, save your breath from trying to evangelize Viking fans, right? Just save your breath. They don't want to hear it and all you're going to do is start a fight. And you may also find out that if you wear your green and gold colors when you happen to be in Minneapolis, you're going to take some abuse. Nobody's got time for evangelizing other sports fans. You either is or you isn't, right? And you just accept it for that. If you are really intense into something like, let's say, you're really into board games in a major way and you go to Gen Con and, and you go uh, to the nerd conventions, you don't go evangelizing that the whole world should become Gen Con lovers. You just go and find the people who are like you. Or if you're a Trekkie and you're obsessed with the Star Trek world, you go to the Trek conventions and you dress up. Or if you're totally into Star Wars and you've got your own white plastic trooper, stormtrooper outfit with the blaster weapon and all that stuff, and you go and hang out with the other nerds, you don't go around your neighborhood uh, with leaflets inviting people to go with you to the Star Wars convention. Because uh, you, do, you don't want any abuse or people making fun of you. You just show up with your other like-minded people. And thanks to the internet, you can find your fellow um, obsessives on just about every possible imaginable human activity. Am I right? Of course I am, at least on this point. <laughs> And you know, I think that's one of the reasons why mission work and mission awareness and mission consciousness in our country has kind of been on a decline. Mission festivals used to be a big deal in churches, and it's kind of sagging a little bit. I think there's some reasons for that. First of all, a lot of denominations are sagging, and so they, their denominational budgets just are not supporting world missions the way they used to back in the day. They just don't have the money to go around. They're in a struggle for their very survival. Even more importantly, I think a second powerful reason is that as we've gotten more tolerant as a society, we've also gotten more tolerant of people's differing worldviews. Now it's, you know, just as it's not very polite for me to try to convert you to loving my sports teams or to convert you to one of my particular obsessions and go to a nerd convention with me, I'm going to save my breath because you got your you got plenty to do. You don't need to be running around after my nerd obsessions. But you do need to know about my Savior because he's your Savior too. And one of the things that has happened in today's world is that it's considered cultural imperialism for people of one culture to go and bring their faith message to another culture. And there are so many shameful examples in the past how... Uh, Western cultures who had, you know, better guns and horses and uh, were able to muscle their way around the world pretty well and colonize things. I mean, imagine how humiliating it was for a 6,000-year-old culture like China to be colonized by, uh, by people back in Europe. That, that they were just bewildered by that. Or the ancient civilization of India to be incorporated into somebody else's empire. Uh, how absurd that must have seemed and how disorienting. And yet, it was that very colonizing activity that also brought the Word of God with it. The Spaniards who came to the New World to find treasures and riches also brought priests and missionaries along with them. And so the, the trick is to let go of the imperialism and the arrogance, but still embrace the fact that people need to know about Christ. They don't know about their Savior by birth. Unless it's revealed to them, they will die in their sins. And that isn't, that's a big deal. Because you, can, you and I can have different political opinions. I don't view it as my job to try to figure out which of you might happen to vote in patterns different from me. 
you can figure that out on your own. I'm just not going to waste a lot of breath trying to convert all of you to my political views. As much as I love democracy or my particular version of it in my head, that doesn't mean that I have to try to get every last one of you to accept my political views. But the Lord Jesus himself has commissioned every one of us, you and me, to care about communicating something that the human race needs for survival. And so my encouragement to you is to find ways to show appreciation and respect for other peoples in the world whose culture, whose language, whose foods, whose um, sports, whose um, cultural expressions, whose art is different from yours. Perhaps, uh, you know, it's easy when you come from a nation with a huge military power and a lot of wealth to look down on people or to push them around or to use that economic and military leverage to try to get your way. That should, though, should not in any way diminish people who know about Christ from wanting to share good news about Christ. Because only through the revelation and sharing of that message can people be brought to faith. No one can figure this out on his or her own. It must be revealed. It must be given. No one can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Spirit. That's right. And God is never going to do your job for you. Your job is to be a teller. He doesn't want you doing his job. Don't pretend that you can convert anybody else. It's not your brilliant arguing or logic or line of argumentation or your information campaign or your marketing skills or what a great philosopher you are or how, how uh, you can lay out the, the oil with your tongue or how good you are at talking or all your other techniques of evangelism. It's not you. The power is in the Word. But God will not make the Word move without you. That's your job. And He will not do your job for you. He will let congregations, church bodies, and even entire denominations die rather than intervene and do their job for them. He will find someone else who will. So here is my commission to you today to care about this process because the Word of God is all bundled up in your lap and that Bible you're holding or it's in the rack in front of you, that is all potential energy. It only does its thing when it's in motion, kinetic energy. When you set it in motion, the Word needs to be told. It needs to be communicated. And even the fact that there are incredible advances in technology today does not take away from you and me the Great Commission where God invites you personally to inform yourself, to care about, to study up on, to pray for, and financially to support the telling of the Word of God in places far away from you to people who maybe aren't like you at all. And I'd like to just have a few tastes of the last half of Romans 15, a remarkable chapter in the Bible. And I'd like to invite you to uh, take your Bible once again and turn to Romans 15. If you can't find a Bible, a mobile device will do. And realize that uh, St. Paul is writing a letter to Romans. That book is usually thought of as being like a doctrine handbook. And in fact, it really is. It's the most um, thorough explanation of the Christian gospel that there is. But the back half of it has a lot of practical advice about how the Christian life is supposed to work. And Paul is writing from Corinth, which is in Greece. Rome is the biggest city in the empire, probably a million people in the 50s AD. Paul is writing about a decade and a half or so after Christ was resurrected from the dead. Maybe somewhere between 15 and 20 years. Hard to pin this down. But Corinth was the second largest city. It's like Chicago. It was a crossroads of trade, both the land trade, the land highways. It sat right on the, the narrow neck of land between the two halves of Greece, and it also was on a major east and west uh, sea route. A lot of the trade had to come through Corinth. And it was a powerful, well-to-do city, very cosmopolitan, uh, heathen to the core. The highest point of the city had a temple to 
Aphrodite, the goddess of love, where there were a thousand women working as prostitutes, as temple prostitutes, so that uh, they could kind of cover two key desires of, of their uh, male customers. Uh, a, you could worship God and hire a prostitute with the same fee. I mean, what, that, that's pretty much a, it sounded like a win-win for them. They made a ton of money <clears throat> and, and yet were morally corrupted through it. And that was right in the middle of the city, right at the top. Everybody could see it. The Acrocorinth was a gigantic uh, upthrust kind of, it's not a mountain is not the right word, but a kind of a, a, a steep ridge and they built that right on the top where everyone could see it. That's where Paul was working right now. And he wrote this letter to an even bigger city. But listen to what he said. He wasn't just settling for the fact that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of my life working on building up this congregation here. He had a restless burn to tell people who hadn't heard yet. And here's what he said. If you would look at, um, we're going to just sort of jump in and I'm going to hop a little bit like skipping a stone. In verse 16 he said, I'm called to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Those are people he grew up being taught to despise and to be afraid of. These were the people who had forcibly annexed the land of Israel into their empire. There was an army of occupation that the loyal Jews in Israel had to look at every day. The Gentiles were thought of as being unspiritual. They're lost, they're pagan, uh, like the plague on them. To hell with all of them is the is how the Jews thought. We don't have any more likelihood of converting them to our faith than um, Michigan fans have of converting Michigan State fans. Just not going to work. Leave them alone. Shun them, fear them, avoid them, stay away. And Paul says, I'm a minister of Christ to the Gentiles. With the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. It's not an option for me. I have to do this. I'm compelled. To what end? Why? So that these unspiritual, unwashed, unsaved people might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Spirit. And now comes a paradox. How does this happen? Is this God's doing or is this my doing? And the answer to that paradox is yes. The answer is yes, it is both. I glory in Christ Jesus, my service to God. I won't speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God, what I've said and done. Verse 20, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not known. So I wouldn't be building on someone else's foundation. So it's God's initiative and my ambition. Both are engaged. Both are involved. Verse 23, Paul writes now, he's spent the first part of his ministry, basically in his home region. Paul is from Tarsus, which is in the southern coastline of what is today Turkey. Can you envision the map of the Mediterranean? Can you think you could find Turkey? If your life depended on it, could you find it on a map? I wonder if you could. I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass you today. I'm, this is not going to be a test to see whether or you're allowed to have lunch today. But Turkey is in the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean, a gigantic landmass jutting out into the Mediterranean. 300,000 square miles. Greece, rocky and rugged. Corinth, a huge city, hundreds of thousands of people. And Paul says from his earlier phases of work, I see there's no more place for me to work in these regions. What? What? It'd be like me saying, yep, um, here we are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we've pretty much, we've been here for 100 years and pretty much successfully evangelized the entire city. You should have me committed to a rubber room if I would utter something so ridiculous. There are people all over the greater metro area of our city who have never experienced the love of Christ, never had explained to them what Christ has done on their behalf. Our work is more urgently needed than ever before. But Paul says, got to go, got to keep moving. Other people can do this. I have to go and tell people who've never heard it before. I, I want to see you. I, he hasn't been to Rome yet. He knows some of the people there. I can't wait to get to see you. I plan to do so because you're basically a stopover for me when I go to Spain. Spain, what? 
There's no airplanes or trains, cars back then, no steam-powered vessels. It was dangerous to travel that far, 1,200 miles away. A lot of it he'd be walking on foot, maybe a carriage ride for part of it or bump around on a wagon. Even getting in a boat could be a death sentence. The storms in the Mediterranean are terrible. In fact, Paul doesn't know it yet, but he's going to suffer a shipwreck that if it were not for the protecting hand of God would have killed everybody on the boat he was on. He has got to move because he wants to tell people not like him that there's hope for them. That they, though they're dying, when you're connected to Christ, you become immortal and you never die. All that the decay of your earthly body means is that you transition into the real life. And anything you lose in this physical world right now, God will replace and much more so in the life of the world to come. Your body will be restored. Your, the wretchedness of your sins has been forgiven. You are declared to be holy and pure and righteous through the blood of Jesus. And whatever hardships you may have undergone will be more than compensated for by blessings. Whatever you've given up on this earth to follow him will be more than adequately replaced. This is a gift, but you have to hear about it for it to do any good. For though it's been given objectively and lovingly to the world, only those who believe it have it. And people have to know. Is this cultural imperialism? No, not really. This is bringing medicine to people who are dying in western Alaska. This is sharing a message to give to people, not to beat them over the head with it, not to bully them, not to pressure them, not to belittle or demean whatever belief system they may have had. A good missionary never makes fun of what comes out of people's mouths, even though it might seem laughable. Just share the good news. And the telling of it is the power of faith creation. It is the telling of it that gives you the ability to believe it. But that faith cannot be synthesized in the individual's own heart. It has to be given. So Paul said, I can't wait. I want to go clear to Spain. And I hope to visit you while passing through and have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. I'm on my, no, I've got I to gotta go to Jerusalem first. We are bringing um, a contribution for the poor among them. Uh, they were pleased to do it. Indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. The Roman Caesars, to punish the Jews for their crabbiness and threats of revolution were intentionally tightening down the faucet of the food supply and intentionally starving the Jews by driving food prices so high. So the Gentile world, which was doing better and had a little more prosperity, was raising money to help the mother church back in Jerusalem and the people who were suffering there. So after I have completed this task and have made sure they've received this fruit, I'll go to Spain and I'll stop and see you on the way. We don't know if he ever made it, my guess is I just I can't imagine that he would. It seemed like he was jumped and arrested while he was in Jerusalem and then came back and ended up dying in Rome, but in chains as a prisoner. It seems to me kind of doubtful that he ever did fulfill his dream to make it to Spain. But he is laying out for us the right kind of attitude towards people not like us, maybe even far away with a different language, who don't know about Jesus yet. And my encouragement to you is to care about world missions, just as Paul did, to care about people far away and not like him. To give them a shot. You can't believe for other people, but you can give them a shot. You can't, by your own persuasiveness, convert or compel other people into the faith, but you can give them a shot. You can set the word loose. You can put it in motion with your prayers, with your organization and interest, with your support, with your financial support, with your interest and organization and willingness to keep sending people, with your willingness to go on, say, personal short-term mission trips yourself. This is something available now to us today that a hundred years ago was very difficult. Uh, because of the ease of air travel and the speed of communication, you can personally get involved in a world mission field and do things to get your own face right in there. And as a transforming and learning experience, there is probably nothing like it in all the world. So let's wrap this all up. Here are my challenges to you today. Number one, care about this. 
the reason why we have a congregation here today is that people a, a half a world away sent at their own expense, trained and sent people to plant congregations in what was a wilderness. And our own church body did not actually have a functioning seminary for at least 20 years. And so the entire first generation was built up by people who had been trained and funded elsewhere. We are the beneficiaries of a mission spirit and we can in turn keep that ball rolling. Care about it. Inform yourself. There is no possible way that anybody whose fingers still work and can operate, has any knowledge of operating a, a, a computer terminal or tapping on a screen, the information is there for you to learn about your brothers and sisters in faith and what they are doing and the sacrifices they are making halfway around the world to share the good news in your name. Find out if it's possible for you to make your own personal trip. This is very doable. Talk to me afterwards if you got a glimmer that you might want to personally be involved. It doesn't matter how much money you have, sometimes that can be found for you too. Your money will be taken from you when you die. What a great investment for you to use some of it to invest in missions, to care about it enough to make sure that even if you can't go, even if it's not your life calling to be a missionary, you are supporting and you are praying for and clapping and cheering for the missionary corps of people who are going, taking the risks and putting their family through the stresses of transplanting and living somewhere else. And then especially if those kids are younger, having to educate them and, go and live within two cultures and two worlds apart. That comes at a cost. And you and I are part of the support network. And above all, we can pray for them and care about them in their wonderful work. And in this way, you and I can see that the gospel doesn't stop here. It doesn't thud into our lives and then stop. But just as all of God's wonderful blessings of the gospel have been given to flow through us, he forgives us so we can forgive others. He shows mercy to us so we can show mercy to others. He's generous to us so we can be generous to other people. He gives us the gospel so that it flows not just to us, but through us. And caring about the progress of the gospel in the world is a wonderful activity that I invite your heart and mind to support today.